Well, Gonzalo, thank you for that lovely introduction. I, I feel so at home here for a number of reasons. Uh, I was first elected to the board of this great organization, FPA, I probably shouldn't admit this, in 1959, and was on the board for most of 30 years except for my time in government. Uh, I'm a very dear friend of your wonderful chairman. Uh, and have the privilege of being um, on the International Advisory Board of uh, Santander, which you should know, if you don't already, is the largest bank in the Eurozone, twice the market capital of uh, um, Deutsche Bank, for example. So it's a great success story. Uh, I'm a little intimidated, however, because I see in the audience uh, the distinguished Consul General of Italy, the distinguished head of the Italian Cultural Institute, uh, John Bradamus, uh, my Oxford classmate, uh, 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 Enzo Viscusi, and my wife, uh, who was my co-ambassador. And uh, if I say something wrong, uh, I'll hear from all those people. Uh, Italy is we'll all agree on this, I believe, an exceptional country. Exceptional because of its natural beauty, exceptional because it is the home of, some people estimate, half of the world's great artistic and cultural patrimony. Uh, its people have a zest for life and a creativity which is quite exceptional. And it's almost everyone's favorite place to visit. Having said that, it is also an exceptionally difficult country to govern. Mm -hmm. Giulio Andriotti, in his low moments, used to say to me, quoting Mussolini, I believe, non è soltanto impossibile governare l'Italia, è inutile. <laughs> it's not only impossible to govern Italy, it's useless. Um, Italy has just concluded its closest election in history, and one of its most bitter. And I'm afraid the prospect that now faces us in Italy only underlines the wisdom of this rather cynical comment about the difficulty of governing Italy. And I will try to do three things tonight. First, to describe the result of the election and what is likely to happen in the next days. Second, to give a little bit of history, because time is short, to the historical origins of this problem of governability. And third, to briefly ask what the new Italian situation means for the United States, for Europe, and for Italy itself. Um, you had a struggle in this election between two coalitions with different visions of Italy's future, certainly different visions in foreign policy, but also to some extent different visions in terms of domestic, economic, and social policy. It was also, of course, uh, a struggle between two personalities who were as different as you could imagine. You had uh, Berlusconi, known as the Cavaliere, uh, not a deep thinker, uh, not an intellectual, but an incredible communicator and showman. Incredibly shrewd politically and in business terms. And just look at how he came from nothing to be the richest man in the country by far uh, and own three, the three major private TV stations and then become prime minister. Um, and I should say I, that I'm the first, I was the first American ambassador to get to know this extraordinary personality. And I'll just, if I, you'll indulge me, because I think this re is re revealing. Uh, I arrived in Italy as ambassador in March of 1977, and I was arranging my first official visit to Milan. And the Consul General of the United States there called me and said, Ambassador, we have your whole trip organized, but there's one problem we have. There's someone we've never heard of named Berlusconi. He's calling us every day, insisting that you come to his private television station 
outside Milan in a suburb in some housing development he's got going. We've never heard of him. We've never heard of this television station. We don't think anybody listens to it. And really, we, we think well, you shouldn't do it. But before we reject his request, we wanted to consult you. Well, fortunately, I said, look, and I'm being, this is uh, probably going to say some things that I shouldn't say. My Italian friends will forgive it. But I said, and this at the time, I said, look, I think Rai, the Italian state network on TV, is so politicized and so boring that if someone wants to develop some private television, he should be encouraged. I'll do it. So I went to Milan Due, which was his housing development outside of Milan, and he interviewed me personally, and I was very impressed and told Danielle, this is, this is an amazing man. And we invited him, as I recall, a couple of times to the residence, and we, in the, my book, there's even a picture of him, uh, along with uh, Giulio Andriotti and uh, Gianni Letta and uh, other persons uh, that you would recognize uh, at my farewell uh, speech after uh, Reagan uh, defeated Jimmy Carter in the 1980 elections. Um, now, on the other side, we have uh, someone as different as you could imagine. Oh, and I should add one thing. And Mr. Berlusconi has one vision in foreign policy, to be the number one friend of the United States, to be the number one friend of George Bush. This is just one little inconvenience that there's somebody named Tony Blair who's maybe a little bit ahead of him. But, but otherwise, 100% for whatever America is doing and 100% for Iraq. And uh, that was perhaps uh, to some extent a liability in this election because 80% of the Italian people, uh, judging by public opinion polls, were very much against uh, what we have been doing, our invasion of Iraq. And, and, and Bush, of course, is very unpopular throughout Europe, including in Italy. Um, so that but he, wants, he wanted to say, a good friend of America, and whatever we think of George Bush and Iraq, we should recognize Italy has been a terrific ally of the United States from the Second World War to the present. And I could, and I, in my book, I describe how they helped win the Cold War with the deployment of the cruise missiles, and I'll get to that in a minute. But 3,000 uh, Italian troops in Iraq, an Italian's contribution to international peacekeeping is second to none. Italians have troops in Afghanistan, in the Balkans, and uh, throughout uh, various difficult places in, in Africa. And we should be grateful for that. Now, on the other side of the spectrum, you have Romano Prodi. Uh, as different as uh, from Berlusconi as you could imagine. Il professore, he's called. And uh, that may be a term of endearment to some, but it's also a term of contempt for others. And being a professore myself, I don't know, but uh, I can't be against the professore. But when some people call him the professore, they have in mind that uh, uh, he's less than uh, always intelligible in what he says, uh, sometimes comes across as a bit befuddled and absent-minded. But everyone admits he is a deep thinker. He is a man of integrity. Uh, and, uh, and, and good faith, and uh, a good economist. And I was fortunately the first American ambassador to get to know Romano, and I'll tell you a little story about that, which I hope will be in its way revealing. Uh, in 1978, after I'd been in Italy one year, uh, Romano, who was a junior minister uh, in the uh, Andriotti government at the time, uh, woke up one morning to find that Andriotti had reshuffled his government, and uh, it was announced on the radio that uh, Prodi was out on the radio. He was not told personally. Well, it happened that day. I had scheduled a lunch with Romano Prodi, because I believed his ambassador one should get to know the, the new generation, and he was then in his 30s. And uh, I heard this on the radio, and then suddenly the phone rings, and Prodi's on the line and says, Ambassador, you heard. I said, yes, I did. He said, well, you know, there's no point in Am I having lunch with you? I mean, I'm no longer anybody. You don't want to waste your time with me. And I said, Romano, what are you talking about? I said, yeah, of course we're going to have lunch. You're a friend. And then I said to him, and I'll make a prediction. You'll be back in government, and one day you'll be prime minister. And he said, no, no, no. And I said, yes, you'll see. Well, in 1986, he became prime minister, and I called him. And I said, do you remember what I promised you? And he had a wonderful answer. He said, yes, Richard. But it took a very long time. <laughs> well, I called him last week after his new victory by a wafer-thin margin, 
And uh, I reminded him, and he says, yes, but it took a very long time to have a second chance. So uh, Romano uh, is a friend of America, and I think we should uh, keep that in mind. I'm not sure all of the heads of his major coalition partners are, but Romano certainly is. And um, he has, however, perhaps a different concept of uh, what friendship means. He said, and this was quoted in the New York Times, he said, uh, a country like America can have two kinds of friends. One that says that America is always right, and the other that tells America when he thinks it's wrong. And uh, I believe America is better served by the second type of friend that tells what it thinks. So George Bush and company will have to learn to get along with that. All right, now what exactly happened in this election? It's very complicated, and since time is limited, I, I'm going to try to make this a bit simple uh, and cut a few corners. But um, as you know, we have a bicameral system in, 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 in Italy. And in the vote for the Camera, the House, the margin was 49.8% of the vote for the coalition led by Prodi and 49.7% for the coalition led by Berlusconi. So it was one-tenth of one percent difference. Of course, uh, uh, Prodi immediately, I mean Berlusconi immediately said, uh, it's a fraud, it's all uh, fixed, it's, it's not fair. And of course, uh, Prodi was able to say, well, you were in charge of this, I and mean, you're in charge of the government, you're in charge of the election. So, I mean, how can you say that? If it's a fraud, you've done it. I mean, so that was a, But uh, it, it's unfortunate that to this moment, um, uh, at least unless something's happened today that I don't know about, although uh, Berlusconi resigned as he was required to, and because the courts have confirmed the results of the election, uh, Berlusconi has still not uh, called Brody to congratulate him, and he doesn't accept the legitimacy of the result, and he's actually said. Uh, he'll make life as difficult as possible for the government and says it won't last long. But anyway, 49.8, 49.7, we have some experience after Florida in, 19, in 2000 of what these things mean. Uh, and uh, maybe Berlusconi outsmarted himself a little bit because he got the electoral law changed so that whoever wins the House gets a big premium uh, to assure that there's some governability at least in the House. And thus, even though there was this wafer-thin margin, uh, because of this automatic bonus to the winner, uh, Prodi's coalition has 348 seats to 281 for Berlusconi, a margin of 67, which is fairly comfortable. Now in the Senate, it's totally different. Again, under the new electoral law, and this gets, I'm not sure I can express this complexity fully, but under the new electoral law in the Senate, the seats are apportioned on the basis of the results in 20 of in the 20 separate regions of Italy and it's done region by region whoever wins in a region gets 55% of the seats that are allocated to that region now thus as a result of this strange uh, for an american uh, rule even though uh, berlusconi's coalition won more seats in the election to the senato uh, Prodi's coalition ends up with a two-vote margin in the Senate, um, 158 seats to 156, a margin of two votes. There are seven senators for life that are also in the Senate, and people estimate, judging for what we know of their preferences, that they might split five to two, uh, perhaps four to three or five to two, in favor of Prodi. But it's a very, very slim margin. Now, making governability even more difficult is, as many of you know, a situation that these are not two homogeneous political parties. Uh, I compare always Italy to Spain, and I'm always very careful in the presence of friends from both countries not to indicate that I prefer one over the other, and I love them both. Spain has one great advantage over Italy. It has the problem of the regional nationalism, the Basques and Catalans, but there are two main national political parties, reasonably homogeneous. They alternate in power, and they're able to take decisions. Not so in Italy. Uh, the Berlusconi coalition had four political parties, 
which quarreled considerably among themselves. And one political party, which isn't even a party, it's a national movement, which is Berlusconi's own movement, the Forza Italia, which I guess you translate as go on Italy, go Italy. And as the, the party that evolved out of the former neo-fascist party, which is now the Alianza Nazionale, uh, and then you have a fragment of the old Christian Democrats, uh, the UDC, and then you have the Lega North, the, the Northern League, which uh, led by Mr. Bossi, who favors, if not autonomy, a complete independence for Padania, the northern part of Italy, at least a good deal of, 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 of uh, autonomy which for many Italians is unacceptable. So they fight among themselves, but that's, that's mild compared to what we're going to have now on the center-left. The center-left consists, yes, of nine political parties. Nine political parties, count them. And the largest is a party of former communists, uh, known as Democrats of the Left. Now, that will shock a lot of Americans. It won't shock me. I was the first ambassador to have dialogue with Italian communists, and I'll get to this story of how I was permitted to do so by Jimmy Carter, uh, very wisely gave me the authority to do this, so I know these people. And I think perhaps they have a certain fondness for me because at a certain time when it was not permitted for American ambassadors to talk to Italian communists, I did so and granted them visas to come to the United States and so on. And uh, these, these, are, these are people who left the Communist Party when it, it split into uh, uh, Social Democrats, which these people are genuinely, and hardline, true-believing, still Marxist-Leninists who think that communism is wonderful, and that they are uh, still in the parliament. That's the sec a second, a second, not the second largest, but a significant part of Prodi's coalition is the Rifondazione Comunista led by Mr. Bertinotti, and they received something over 6% of the votes for the House and over 7% for the votes in the Senate. So they have quite a few senators and members of the House. And given the narrow margin in the Senate, two or three votes, uh, they, have to, they have a veto. They can hold hostage whatever reform program Mr. Prodi wants to put forward. Then you have something called the Margarita, which I guess you'd translate daisy chain, which probably sounds like a strange name for a political party to an American, and that consists of a group of former, I don't know, a cluster of, of, of former radicals and liberals and socialists and so, led by Mr. Rutelli, former mayor of, of Rome. They're fairly, on the whole, a very moderate group, and they combined with the uh, former communists, the uh, Democrats of the left, are, have something called the, uh, the Olivo, and they really are the dominant element in this coalition. But there's this Bertinotti hardline group, and Mr. Bertinotti insisted on becoming president of the House, which is a very important position. Uh, it's more than formal. It has power to influence the agenda in, in significant ways. So that uh, gives him a, a, a very prominent position, which is disturbing to some people. Then you have the a coalition of Greens, uh, the environmental group, and then you have uh, a group called the uh, Rosa Nel Puno. I'm not sure how you would translate the rose in the fist or something like that, which consists of uh, uh, well, some very eminent uh, people who are former radicals and, and socialists. Uh, and then there's the um, uh, Sud Tirol Volkspartei, which is the small group from the Alto Adige of German-speaking uh, Italians. And then you have the a fragment of the old Christian Democrats called Popolari or Udeur. And yes, the Italy of Values, uh, which is led by a very uh, famous in Italy judge named Di Pietro, who was the one who launched the clean hands uh, investigations in Milan uh, from 1990 to 1992. Well, how is Mr. Prodi, who has no party, by the way, he's a former Christian Democrat, how is he going to keep all these parties together when they have to uh, make tough decisions on economic and foreign policy questions? That is, that is the issue. Now, um, let me, uh, well, you, you might ask what happens now? Um, and uh, if I say something wrong, 
my two friends here from Italy will, will tell me so. But I, my, my information is that, number one, it's been agreed just in the last 24 hours that the parliament, uh, two leaders of the two houses of parliament agree that there will be an election for the president of Italy, because we have not only the uh, election for, for, of a new parliament and therefore a new prime minister, but a new president. And the new prime minister cannot be appointed until there's a new president, because the existing president, uh, Carlo Azzedio Ciampi, a man of great eminence, former head of the Bank of Italy, says that he wants this to be done by his successor. So uh, they're accelerating the vote for the new president, and that vote is taken by these two houses together, the Senate and the House, plus representatives of the regions. Together these are called the Grand Electors. They amount to 1,010. And uh, so someone has to get a, uh, in the first votes, you have to get a two-thirds majority uh, of that number. But if it, you don't get an outcome in the first three votes, it goes to a, a, a simple majority. 504, uh, 506, whatever, of the, the 1,010. Now, um, who's going to be the next president of Italy? Well, Mr. Berlusconi uh, said a few days ago, well, uh, the election was so close, the country's divided in two. Uh, these terrible communists, because he calls them communists, the, the protein people are communists, they control the parliament and the government. I should control the presidency. And therefore, my candidate is Johnny Letta. And Johnny Letta is an admirable man. Those of you who know him, he's really an absolutely outstanding person who is the right hand of Berlusconi. But the left, the center left, said, look, we won. We're not going to divide the powers that way. Well, then the latest uh, offer uh, of Berlusconi says, well, all right, if you don't take Letta, I want the present president to stay. Well, the present president, uh, Ciampi, is, is, is admired by everybody, and uh, he's been a very good president. But he's 85 years of age, and the term of office is seven years. <laughs> and uh, everybody was waiting. And, and, and Mr. Prodi, very shrewdly, in response to Berlusconi, said, well, I'm not against that if President Ciampi is willing to do it. Well, we just heard uh, this today that President Ciampi said no. Thank you very much. I mean, I think it's time for me to go. Well, then, uh, there are two names that are being put forward by the center-left coalition. One is Massimo D'Alema, who uh, is a former prime minister um, and who is the president of the Democrats of the left, which is the largest element in the center-left coalition. But uh, very tough for Berlusconi to swallow that. And uh, not only Berlusconi, but a lot of Italians who have worries about the center-left and the influence even of former communists might say, maybe not, not, not a good idea. So they go to the second name, and the second name, Mirabile Dictu, is none other than Giuliano Amato, a socialist, uh, a constitutional lawyer, a graduate of our law faculty at Columbia Law School, former master of law, so he can't be all bad, uh, one of the great constitutional lawyers of Italy and indeed of the world. Uh, and if he is in fact, and I would hope and expect that that is the result, chosen to be president of Italy, it would be a good thing for Italy, and I think all of us who care about Italy would feel uh, very good about that. Uh, this will uh, happen uh, on Monday, or if it takes several votes on Tuesday, and then by certainly by the end of the next week, uh, the new president uh, will uh, ask Prodi to form a government. Prodi will present his list of ministers, and uh, we'll have a new government, and then we'll have to see how they govern. Uh, there are two people who are almost certain to be in the list of ministers, and I'll just mention them to give you a flavor of what can be expected. The Minister of Foreign Affairs probably will be Massimo D'Alema, since he won't be uh, president of the country. Uh, I'm a bit prejudiced in his favor, because my son-in-law, um, Ambassador Francesco Olivieri, who married my daughter Nina, partly as a result of our service in Italy. Uh, my son-in-law served Massimo as his diplomatic advisor when Massimo was uh, prime minister and uh, speaks very well of him. He was a good friend of the United States in the difficult days of the Kosovo War and was quite supportive uh, of, 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 of what was going on in those days. Of course, that was a different administration. It was Clinton. 
but um, I think uh, he is someone that uh, this administration will be able to work with if it works hard at it. And then the other key job is the uh, man who will be uh, head of the Treasury, uh, the economic czar in effect, and that's going to be uh, Tommaso Padova Schioppa, it's uh, almost certain to be, and uh, he is uh, a, a man of great eminence. He's been the, uh, on the executive board of the uh, European Central Bank. Uh, he's been a director general of the Central Bank of Italy. He's been head of the uh, CONSOB, uh, the, anti the uh, uh, securities, uh, uh, in effect like our SEC securities, uh, and, and uh, the supervising of the, uh, of, uh, of the stock market. And uh, he's now a professor at Sciences Po in Paris and uh, someone that uh, we could be very, f I think the international capital markets would be very happy to see him in charge. But the hard question is, again, with this coalition, uh, what kind of policies can they put through? All right, now just a word about the past, and I'll be very quick about this because I want to leave plenty of time for discussion. Um, why is Italy so difficult to govern? Uh, and, and that's a profound question, and I'm not smart enough to know the answer, quite honestly, but I'll just give some reasons that people mention. Well, first of all, Italy is a relatively new country. It doesn't have the sense, maybe, of, of nationhood that, that Spain does. Italy only became a country in the 1860s. And then for a while, the Vatican was against the new Italy and, and really ordered Catholics not even to take part in the elections. Uh, and then Italy before then, of course, for centuries have been governed uh, by uh, other countries, which engendered a deep suspicion of government in the average Italian. The Italians are kind of anarchists at heart, or at least many of them are. And if they have a loyalty, they have a loyalty to their city or their region. And this is known as campanalismo. The campanile, of course, is the you know, bell tower. And uh, therefore, they're Venetians, or they're Florentines, or they're Sicilians, uh, more than they uh, feel a loyalty to the country. And then Italy has been, as you know, uh, deeply divided uh, ideologically between right and left. Marxism, Leninism had a strong hold there, uh, particularly after the collapse of fascism and Mussolini's government. The communists had uh, derived benefit of being part of the uh, of the opposition to fascism, uh, and uh, that, uh, and they came th through as, as as a major political force after World War II, and the dominant ideology in, in much of the university world when I was ambassador was Marxism-Leninism, and then the other pole, of course, uh, is is a non-Marxist, anti-communist, of, uh, often uh, church-led, but also liberals and 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 uh, secular uh, folks. Uh, so there's a deep ideological split, a deep split geographically, of course, between uh, North and South. And, uh, of course, a split between uh, the Catholics and the secular groups. So putting that together is hard. And Italians are, as I said, individualists and suspicious of government. And after World War II, they adopted an electoral law uh, which is, uh, has a strong element of proportional representation in it, unlike what we're used to, where somebody, my, see my dear friend John Bradamus, who was in Congress for, what, 24 years, 20 years? 22. 22. You know, he had one district in South Bend, and if he won the majority, or the plurality, he was the, he won. Uh, it's never been that way in Italy, and, and now they've even made things, they've gone, it's always been proportional representation in some degree, and now they've gone back to 75% of the seats elected through a proportional system, which means that you have an area and you allocate the seats in proportion to the number of votes, which gives small parties uh, a chance to be represented in a way that is not possible in the Anglo-American system. And that just aggravates, uh, in my view, the problem of governability. Um, after World War II, the big question was, who is going to govern Italy? Is it going to be the left or the right? or the center-right, led by the Christian Democrats, who emerged as the main party uh, after the war. Communists were the second largest, the socialists were a poor third. And since most Italians were afraid of 
Italy being governed by the Communist Party, for 30 years uh, between World War II and the time I arrived in Italy as ambassador, it was Italy was governed by the Christian Democrats in shifting alliances with the socialists and small parties, the Republicans, liberals, social democrats. So the same people were in office. Uh, uh, Amintori Fanfani had been prime minister five times by the time I arrived. Giulio Andreotti was prime minister seven times before he retired. So a lot of people got sort of tired of seeing the same people in office. It was known as stable instability. Uh, <laughs> Because the same people were in charge, it just moved around. Every and the average government lasted a year. Uh, I saw five governments in the four years during which I was ambassador. Um, well, that system led to a lot of inbreeding and uh, corruption and clientelism, and uh, people were increasingly discontent. But they were afraid to put the communists in power. Now, when I, uh, when Jimmy Carter was elected. We found that the American reputation in Italy, and I have to be a little brutal about this, but I don't think I exaggerate. My book tries to document it. Our reputation in Italy was very low because uh, some of my predecessors, particularly one, Graham Martin, uh, identified America's interest as doing anything to stop the communists, even helping some of the most disreputable neo-fascist and right-wing people and a lot of money was CIA money was put into the hands of a man named Vito Micheli who was head of the Secret Services of Italy and then ran for parliament on the neo-fascist ticket but in addition Graham Martin's closest advisors were people like uh, Paul Marcinkus uh, who had to resign because of his disgraceful way he ran the Vatican Bank and Michele Sintona who was put in jail for fraudulent financial activities and a man named Pierre Talent who was a Nixon fundraiser who was charged by the Italian government with aiding and abetting a coup d'etat by Prince Valerio Borghese in 1970. He wasn't finally convicted, but he was asked to leave the country. So the image of the U.S. was not exactly the best. Jimmy Carter said, uh, we're not going to do that anymore. We're not going to play that kind of game. And in his inaugural address, he said something which, as I read these lines today, I get emotional about. Here's what he said, Jimmy Carter, you know, much maligned Jimmy Carter, who I think history will judge more highly uh, than many Americans judge him today. Carter said, we will not behave in foreign places so as to violate our rules and standards here at home. For we know that this trust which our nation earns is essential to our strength. Maybe we should put those words into the Oval Office and have them read every morning. Uh, because the soft power, to use that wonderful phrase of my friend Joe Nye at Harvard, that trust and respect and friendship and admiration which the U.S. used to enjoy in the world, if you don't have that, all the military power in the world is not going to give you a successful foreign policy. Now, Jimmy Carter didn't understand only soft power, although he, he also understood military power. And what he did in Italy was, he said, first of all, we're not going to deal with this extreme right-wing group. We're going to deal with centrist and center-left. The Socialist Party, which was off-limits to my predecessors, became friendly. We got to know Bettino Croxy with all his faults. We felt it was important to encourage a democratic socialism. We allowed communists to have visas to go to the United States. I was authorized to open a dialogue with a number of communist leaders, including Giorgio Napolitano, uh, who, a very respected person who became a great friend. Uh, we allowed, uh, not only allowed, we encouraged some of the great artists and writers and filmmakers uh, of Italy, uh, the Fellinis and the Wertmillers and the Manzus uh, and, uh, and Shashas to come to our residence, people who had been uh, denied uh, uh, any access to the American embassy because they were, they were considered leftists. Things went so far as that my immediate predecessor denied a visa uh, to Italy's leading flautist, Severino Gazzelloni, because he played his flute at a communist rally at, w at one point. He wasn't a communist. He wouldn't let him come to the United States. Well, we changed all that. Beyond that, 
Carter wanted to show the Italian people that our interest in them was not as a floating aircraft carrier of NATO bases and so on, but we cared about them and we wanted to help Italy deal with its major institutional problems and help it reform. And we launched a program called the Strategy of Cooperation, which I describe in my book that covered a whole range of areas from education and energy to health, narcotics, crime, uh, and investment in the Italian South. And I'm not going to say that this by itself changed everything, but I will say this, the Communist Party grew steadily from 19% to 34.4% uh, before I came, and 8% of that increase was under Nixon and Ford. During our four years, with Jimmy Carter, uh, for the first time, the Communist Party lost votes in 1979 election. They went down by 4%, and from then on, they never recovered. And that made it possible to deploy the cruise missiles in Italy, which Mikhail uh, Gorbachev said in his memoirs was the turning point in the Cold War, because without Italy's participation, the Germans would not have accepted missiles, and these were the essential counterpart of NATO to the massive buildup of Brezhnev with the SS-20s. And that had a big effect in winning the Cold War. So much so that um, a, a, a Republican CIA director under President George Bush Sr. said uh, some years ago in an all too rare tribute, I believe, I'm quoting here, I believe historians and political observers alike have failed to appreciate the importance of Jimmy Carter's contributions to the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War. Well, my book tries to explain why Carter deserves that. I conclude very briefly uh, with uh, the problem of Italy's governability now. <clears throat> if you have Dilemma as foreign minister, as I think is likely, and if you have Paolo Vaschioppa as treasury minister, you have two pillars of solidity. It then becomes necessary uh, for Prodi to master some of these small parties, and particularly the we found it coming and said, Mr. Bertinotti. I've met Mr. Bertinotti. He does say some, from an American point of view, pretty terrible things. Uh, he wants to nationalize instead of denationalize. He's, he's quite critical of the United States, sometimes perhaps with reason, sometimes I think without. Uh, I, I hope in his new institutional position as head of the House, uh, that will help to moderate him. He's a man of responsibility. He now knows he's, he's responsible as in this very important institutional position, and I have to believe that he is, at least for a while, going to cooperate in undertaking the kind of programs that Romano Prodi wants to undertake. But in terms of, uh, and, and they are necessary, I mean, Italy has been losing competitiveness, its share of its market, world market share has dropped from 4.8 to 3.8 percent because of rising wage costs. It's challenged by, obviously, China and India and Eastern Europe with low wage rates. The made in Italy formula uh, is hard to sustain, uh, so much so that, you know, Benetton, used to have 90% of its products made in Italy, now it's only making 30% in Italy because they've had to go to China and other places where labor costs are lower. Italy's debt is the highest in Europe, 106% of GDP. Its growth last year was zero, picking up a little bit now. But reforms are vitally important in the labor area and other areas and in the fiscal area. Foreign policy uh, is going to take understanding on the part of both the center left in Italy and the Bush administration if we're to maintain the good relations that are essential for the self-interest of Italy and the United States and the transatlantic relationship. I believe that if the Bush administration shows the kind of flexibility that Jimmy Carter did uh, during the period in which I was privileged to serve him and not be ideological, but willing to talk to people, even with a Marxist background, and 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 uh, listen to what they have to say, and realize that even center leftists who have been communists can be supportive, as Dilemma was, of of uh, NATO interests, uh, as they were in the Kosovo War. Uh, that if we if we handle this with with with, with intelligence, this uh, this relationship can be. Uh, saved. <clears throat> At the same time, the center-left <clears throat> in Italy will have to recognize that even though they prefer, and they've made it very clear, the other America, when they talk about the other America, they mean the America of Roosevelt 
and Truman and Kennedy and Carter and Clinton. Uh, they turned out in great force uh, in Boston for the Democratic Convention, these leaders of the, what is now going to be the center-left coalition. They're going to have to recognize that the America they're going to deal with for the next two and a half years is George Bush. And whatever their preferences might be, it's in their interest to work with us. If that can be brought out, brought forward, and made possible, we will have the kind of Italian-American relationship which is in the interest of the two countries and really a fundamental interest for the relation of the West. Thank you very much. Please uh, identify yourself uh, when you uh, recognize and remember <laughs> Questions ought to end up in an up note with a question mark and not be very long statements. The floor is yours. So who, ah, my wife's going to ask the first question. <laughs> I was afraid of that. <laughs> okay. What are Robbie's plans for troop withdrawal in Iraq? Is he going to pull a Zapatero? Did you all hear the question? <clears throat> what are Prodi's plans for withdrawing the 3,000 Italian troops from uh, Iraq? Will he pull a Zapatero? The reference is to the Prime Minister of Spain, who was elected two years ago, and very brusquely uh, he pulled the troops out. Yes, the troops are coming out. I think the Italian troops are coming out. Uh, well, now, that's the question. Uh, Berlusconi himself said that by the end of the year they would be out. Um, and I think you can certainly figure that they're coming out by the end of the year. I'm hoping that uh, Prodi will do this in with a certain finesse and diplomacy uh, and just do a drawdown, a gradual drawdown. He's also made it clear, if you read his um, party platform, and this was accepted by his coalition partners, that even if they're going to take their troops out of Iraq, and that is a commitment they made, they're going to be very uh, supportive of the NATO effort in Afghanistan, to which they do not object, because it was done by NATO, and they have no doubt that supporting uh, Karzai and the effort to build democracy in Afghanistan is a worthy uh, matter in the interest of the West, so they will be helpful there. They've also made it clear that they will help the Iraqi government, not with troops, but through uh, democracy building and financial assistance. And they'll continue uh, Italy's magnificent leadership and in international peacekeeping. So uh, I think that Americans should see that as a as a perfectly reasonable thing with which we can live. Sir. Uh, Joel Rogers, I was wondering if there was any uh, chance that with Bush and some of his more extreme advisors sort of in retreat whether Condoleezza Rice might at least be reasonably acceptable and have a little better, uh, more possibilities for reasonable foreign uh, relations with Italy. Well, I think Condoleezza Rice um, has brought uh, a degree of moderation uh, in the second term compared to what we saw in the first term. How far this is rhetoric and how far it is translated into practice, one can argue about, but Condoleezza Rice has made, I think, a heroic effort uh, right after she was chosen to, to go to Europe and be reassuring and listen. Uh, so that's positive. Um, but the proof's in the pudding, and uh, we, we're going to see uh, what policy are we going to follow in Iraq, uh, and then Iran is the big question looming over the horizon. Well, not always, already with us. This could be another major test of the transatlantic relationship, how we handle Iran. And then you have other questions. Uh, if the Doha round collapses, we're going to have a very difficult uh, period of finger-pointing who, who's responsible. Uh, the Europeans, because of their failure to give more on agriculture, the United States, for our failure to, and uh, that, that's going to be very ugly. So we have a transatlantic trade relationship uh, at issue here. Uh, and then the war on poverty. Uh, the, I think this new government in Italy will 
be very committed uh, to doing more on AIDS and on a poverty in Africa and elsewhere. We we'll want to see uh, the U.S. leadership uh, uh, commensurate with our economic power and so on across the board, relations with Putin, with China. Uh, but Iran is going to be the big, uh, that's the big issue. And uh, I have no idea, uh, I, don't, I, haven't, I don't think the, the Protease people have not spoken out very clearly on what they think should be done about Iran. John Bradamus, yeah. Uh, they've got this brilliant analysis. Uh, thank you for it. Uh, to what extent does the Vatican play a significant role in Italian politics today? Well, that's a, that's a very important question, and I, 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 I've always been a professor who, when he's asked a question, uh, is willing to say, you know, I'm not sure. <laughs> There's some things I don't know. Um, certainly, the Polish Pope devoted his main attention to things outside of Italy, and you can give him, uh, as well as Ronald Reagan and Jimmy Carter, I think, credit for the overthrow of communism in Eastern Europe. Uh, but he didn't, didn't have that much to say about uh, internal matters in Italy. Uh, what will this pope do? Um, some people think he will be more of a presence in, in terms of the domestic scene. Um, but that's going to be tough because the center-left in power is going, to, is going to push back very hard against what looks like Vatican interference in politi political and uh, social policies. And you know, Italy today, uh, it's a quote, a Catholic country, but its policies on abortion and uh, homosexuality and so on is, uh, is pretty far uh, evolved, uh, maybe even further than we are. And by the way, you know what the birth rate in Italy is? Uh, per couple, it's 1.3, uh, 1.3 children per couple, which is well below replacement Great fertility, so much that the Italian population, which is now 58 and a half million, will be 50 million uh, in, after a generation and a half, uh, which is another big problem. An aging population, and how do you support health care and social security? Uh, and who's going to do the work? Uh, but um, so, uh, an attempt by the Pope to to push his agenda, particularly the agenda which needs to be fairly conservative of this Pope, will exacerbate internal tensions uh, in Italy. So I think he's going to be very cautious about it. But I just don't know. It's an interesting point, interesting question. Consul General, sir. Um, you have described Berlusconi striving to be perceived as America's best friend. What an extent do you think he succeeded? Did he manage to enhance Italy's uh, status in the eyes of the American public opinion? He certainly enhanced uh, Italy's stature in the eyes of Republicans. Uh, and not so much in the eyes of Democrats. I mean, giving you, I mean, that's because it became a very partisan thing. I mean, he was just uncritical and fully supportive of Iraq and everything that uh, Bush was trying to do. Um, he made Italy a, a very much more visible uh, to to Americans. There's no question about that. Uh, and uh, he showed great flair and panache in bringing people to Italy for summit meetings and on television bringing Putin over to see Bush and you know giving the sense that Italy was playing a role in bringing people together. How much of that was show and how much was substance it can be argued. But he did give Italy a role on the world stage. Yes, I mean we can't deny that. And if you read the Financial Times and The Economist, it was not a role that uh, at least the British respected very much, but it was a role. Um, and uh, Prodi will have a hard act to follow uh, in this regard. Uh, I should, by the way, I mean, uh, he, uh, there was a certain amount of success uh, in, uh, for uh, Berlusconi in all this because he got an invitation from Bush to come to Washington on the eve of the election campaign and be honored uh, by addressing both houses of Congress having a press conference with President Bush, in which Bush very openly endorsed Berlusconi's re-election, said, I want him to be re-elected, which uh, seems to, uh, I, I think uh, if I'd been the ambassador, I would have said to the president, don't do that. We should not be doing that. 
uh, in an election between in a friendly allied country where both parties are in good faith, you know, uh, democratically oriented. Uh, I took a position against communists coming to power at the time I was in Italy because they were so obviously still, at least many of the Italian communists when I was there, were uh, openly pro-Soviet and anti-American. So we thought it was not a good idea to have the Communist Party in power. But this group, uh, uh, these are social democrats and, uh, and a miscellany of others who are leading. There is the problem of, of Mr. Bertinotti, of the Rifondazione, but I, I don't see him as the kind of threat that the Italian Communist Party was at the time uh, I was in Italy. In any case, it seemed counterproductive for the American president to have intervened in that way, and it didn't, didn't help Berlusconi. I think it might have actually been a negative. Uh, yes, it was my professor friend here, and then the lady. Yeah. Uh, Sarwar Kashmiri. Yes. I have two questions. One is you hear a lot about the issues uh, in integrating Muslims in European society. Yes. And I wonder if you can address that. That's also a factor in Italy. And secondly, do you can you conceive of any circumstance in uh, that will force Italy to drop out of the Eurozone? Two again, wonderful questions. Uh, there are 2.4 million immigrants in Italy, uh, 400,000 illegals, by the way, and of the 2.4 million, a third are Muslim. Um, and uh, this is a very small percentage compared to what the French face, but it's uh, a source of great concern to the Italians, uh, for, to the government because of the dangers of terrorism. And to the average Italian, I think, is not, not that happy with, uh, with, with the presence of as many Islamics. Uh, we in the United States are much more comfortable with immigration. We're, we're a country built on immigration. Italy has been historically a country of emigration. It was considered overpopulated and poor, and therefore it was comfortable with people leaving. It's so much less comfortable with people coming. Uh, and there's a certain amount of, uh, of hostility uh, uh, to, to, to foreigners, but particularly to Islamics. Um, so uh, that's an uncomfortable relationship. But, uh, and there'll be, a, there'll be a battle. Immigration will be an issue in Italy as well as is so much in our country right now. I think the, the center left will be somewhat more open to legal immigration than uh, and asylum seekers than, than the Berlusconi government. But I'm not sure, that they may not be supported that much by the average Italian. Uh, the second question was on, yes, the, the Euro. Uh, it's, again, I'm glad you asked that because I, it enables me to make a point that I didn't have time to make. Italy could compensate during the time I was ambassador and before and since for its inability to be competitive. Uh, it's uh, high labor costs uh, out of line with the rest of Europe. Uh, it's a uh, huge uh, fiscal debt and all that. It could compensate by repeated devaluations of the lira. Uh, they made a decision uh, at the end of the last decade, as you know, uh, which makes that impossible now. They took the courageous decision. It was Prodi who did it, and he was prime minister, to join the Eurozone. And the reason behind it was very clear, because until Italy did that, uh, it would have to pay much higher interest on its debt and wouldn't be regarded as a safe place to invest and, you know, wouldn't have credibility. And also, the Italians want to be part of Europe. After all, the Treaty of Rome was launched in Italy, and they're very proud of that. So um, most uh, Italians, I believe, still think it was right to go into the Euro, and for Italy now to say, it's just too hard for us to maintain competitiveness. We can't control our, our labor movement. We can't make our labor market more flexible, hold down costs, uh, increase R&D. We just can't do it. So uh, we're going to have to devalue and we'll leave the euro. This would be a catastrophic decision. It will, ne it will never be made with Prodi's approval, because after all, he was president of the European Commission. He said, unlike Berlusconi, who was Eurosceptic and had ministers calling for leaving the euro, uh, Prodi and his people will, will not do that. So I think Italy will stay in, in the euro, but it does imply 
that they're going to have to have a much more rigorous uh, economic policy uh, than they've had so far to become competitive. Yes. My name is uh, Vincenzina Santoro. Uh, I'm an economist. Yes. And I used to be head of economic research uh, for a major American bank uh, in Italy for a while. I have two questions to yes. make. The first, uh, what do you see in the Prodi uh, program insofar as dealing with some of Italy's uh, outstanding economic problems? And number two, on the political side, uh, how influential were uh, American advisors uh, from Democratic side in helping Mr. Prodi and his campaign. Well, the second part of your question is fascinating. I don't know. I, I don't know. It's quite possible. I, think I interrupted. Do you know? Just teasing. Yeah. Uh, I sat next to Mr. Prodi at the NYU Law School a year uh -huh. ago, and uh, when he was uh, running the European Commission, and uh, given my background, yes. he told me that Cyprus is my biggest headache, and I told him, well. Uh, if you like, having been a politician in my country, if you want me to come back and manage your campaign, I'll be glad. <laughs> now, it, may, it, it, it may be. Uh, we have a lot of these uh, uh, campaign advisors who have been, who've been advising. Well, who's the, who's the one? I always forget his name. You know, who would, who's been his every unsuccessful Democratic campaign he's advised. Uh, Shrum, Shrum. He's on our faculty now. Oh. <laughs> All right. Well, Mr. Shrum, uh, Mr. Shrum uh, rents himself out uh, to to in between American uh, elections to foreigners, and he may have advised Brody, but he hasn't run an, a successful American election in a long time. I'm being a little cruel, but uh, no, I just don't know the answer to that. But the economic issue, I can answer. Um, if you look at the uh, Party platform. They published this. You've probably seen it in Italian. Uh, exactly. Uh, the Benessere d'Italia, about 40 pages. A lot of fluff. I mean, it's very vague. Uh, they 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 talk in terms of all the right objectives. We're going to uh, have a. We're going to increase research and development. We're going to make Italy more competitive. We're going to have a more flexible labor market. We're going to control fiscal things. But where's the the dunque or whatever. Where's the you know? Where's the the, the, the meat? Where's the beef? <laughs> yeah. Uh, now take take one thing that I find very worrisome: uh, the Biaggi law. Uh, and again, I ask my Italian friends here if I say this not quite right, they'll correct me. But Berlusconi did take some steps to uh, liberalize the labor market. Uh, a similar thing to what the French are now having trouble over, uh, having uh, temporary contracts for young people so that uh, a company uh, doesn't feel that if it hires a young worker that he's, they're stuck with him for 50 years, 30 years. Uh, and, but you know what happened to poor Mr. Biaggi who recommended this law? He was shot. He was killed. He was killed. Um, and, uh, Prodi, under pressure, I guess, from Bertinotti and his left, uh, said he's going to change the law. He's going to uh, amend that. Maybe not abrogate it totally, but, you know, move it backwards. That's not reassuring. Um, and, uh, again, uh, he, he's, how's he going to deal with the problem of the fiscal deficit, which will be over 4%? Uh, 3%, as we all know, is the limit permitted under the, in the Eurozone. Uh, uh, not always respected by the French and Germans, but the Italians are over 4% and rising, and the largest debt in Europe. So, uh, how's he going to deal with that? What's he going to cut? Uh, and uh, he says he wants to do a lot more with infrastructure, not to build the uh, the famous uh, bridge over the Messina uh, connecting Sicily with... Uh, uh, some people think connecting Sicily by a bridge to Italy is a bad idea uh, on its merits. But anyway, uh, he won't do that. Uh, Berlusconi promised it. But he wants to do other infrastructure. Uh, he wants to do more to improve universities and uh, so on. Where's the money coming from? Uh, he has to find an answer to that question.